So this uh, talk is about lightweight multiplication in uh, finite fields and application to linear layer of block ciphers. And this is joint work with uh, Thorsten Kranz and uh, Gregor Leander. So you probably all know the common, uh, a common block cipher design of a substitution permutation uh, network, which is based on a round uh, iterated key alternating cipher. And uh, every round consists of an uh, S-box layer, which is made up on the parallel application uh, of n-bit S-boxes, followed by a linear layer, which is for mixing the outputs of the S-box over the whole state. And today we focus on the construction of this linear layer. And if you want to design it, the goal is always to optimize it once in terms of security, of course, and it's a second step in, in uh, terms of efficiency. And uh, lots of constructions of uh, linear layers we, we know um, uh, are based on so-called maximum distance separable codes, or also called MDS codes. And uh, lots of uh, ciphers follow this approach. And for example, the well-known AES is one of, one of these examples. And the advantage of this code-based approach is the so-called wide trail strategy, which allows for strong arguments on the security uh, of a primitive. So let me give an example. What does MDS matrix mean? And it means that it reaches an optimal branch number over two consecutive rounds, which means that we can guarantee an optimal number of active S-boxes for differential and uh, linear attacks. And if you are not familiar with differential and linear attacks, all you have to remember in this talk is that an equivalent formulation is that every square submatrix has to be non-singular. And um, then the matrix will be MDS. And uh, in this example, um, we see that if we, if we choose a generic field element alpha, then we can make this uh, matrix MDS for a suitable alpha. And uh, the conditions uh, on this uh, property can be phrased as polynomials in alpha. All you have to do is you have to compute the determinants uh, of all these submatrices, and then you can see a list of equations. So a list of uh, polynomials for which alpha uh, does not need, uh, does not have to, uh, should not be a root of, uh, of these pol polynomials. Okay, so for example, alpha should not be equal to zero because otherwise we would have a zero entry, which is a one times one matrix with determinant zero. zero. Or if you consider, okay, uh, if you consider uh, other matrices, then uh, you see that these, uh, the other equations have, uh, has to, uh, have to hold. So then uh, we have two elementary questions we want to address. The first is how to multiply with an element uh, alpha most efficiently. And the second question is how to use the knowledge of uh, the efficient multiplication with a fixed element to construct lightweight MDS matrices. And there is uh, some recent uh, related work on, uh, on these questions from uh, FSE 2015, 2016, and recently from Africa Group 2016. Um, in the, the FSE e papers are about uh, constructing uh, lightweight MDS matrices uh, under polynomial uh, basis for, for the finite field. And the a Africa Group paper focus on the exo count distribution uh, of elements on the more than polynomial basis. And in this talk, we also focus on, uh, on all possible basis uh, for the finite field representation. So let me first go to, go to this question, how to multiply with an element alpha most efficiently. So we have given uh, such an element, and we want to consider the function f alpha, which maps an element beta to the element beta multiplied by alpha. And there is a natural representation of the finite field as a vector space with n, uh, with n components. So if we want to, to consider this finite field as, a vector, as an n-dimensional vector space, we have to choose a particular basis for this representation. And if we, cho if we have chosen the basis for this vector space, then we con can um, uh, can form, formulate this, this mapping as a matrix multiplication um, with a matrix depending on this basis because 
the function multiplying with the fixed element alpha is a linear function, and a linear function can be represented uh, with a matrix multiplication. So, all what we have, uh, but what we need now is we need an appropriate metric for the efficiency um, of a matrix, which is called the XOR count of a matrix. We define it as follows. For an n-dimensional vector, we consider the linear function XOR ij, which just XORs the i's component to the j's component and stores the value in the, in the i's uh, component. And in matrix notation, this is just the identity matrix plus one additional uh, one entry in the i's row and the j's column, and all en other entries are ze zero. And now we define the XOR count of an invertible matrix as the smallest number t, such that m can be represented as t of these XOR factors, and then we are free of applying a permutation matrix afterwards, because permutation uh, in hardware uh, does not cost any XOR operations. So there is uh, to note that we are also free to apply these permutation matrices after every XOR step, but without loss of generality, we can we can just um, permute at the end. So now we know how to measure efficiency. We just compute the number of XOR operations needed to implement this matrix M alpha. And it is to note that for technical reasons, we here restrict to XOR operations without using temporary registers. That means we are using in-place opera operations. So we are not allowed to store an intermediate value uh, in an external register and use it afterwards. If we overwrite it here, then it is overwritten. But um, it, is, it makes no difference if the XOR count is smaller or equal to two. And since all of our uh, constructions will have an XOR count smaller or equal to two, um, this makes no uh, difference in, in our case. So let me give an example of this choice of basis operation. So if we, if we uh, rep represent our finite field in, uh, polynomial, uh, in polynomial terms, which means we uh, represent all elements as polynomials and then module, we compute modular the, an irreducible polynomial, then we uh, can consider the so-called polynomial basis, which is made up on this powers of x. And if we now want to multiply with an element, uh, with the element x, then the, um, the appropriate matrix will be of this form. Yeah, and this is intuitively, this is, you can see why this is the case. This is just a left shift. If you want to multiply a polynomial with x, then you shift the coefficients one position to the left, and later you substitute the x to the four uh, term by this x plus one, which you can see here in the, in the last column. So and there's a special, this is a special kind of matrix. This is a so-called companion matrix of, um, of this irreducible polynomial. And in general, the companion matrix is defined as follows. For a polynomial in GF2, in GF um, the companion matrix is defined as having all ones in this minor diagonal and the coefficient on, uh, of the polynomial in the, last, um, in the last column. Okay, so back to our question. For a given field element, what is the most efficient basis? We want to answer the following, which field elements can be implemented most efficiently? So we kind of turn the question around. And the first step uh, you, uh, we did is we tried to identify elements with optimal XOR count. Um, based on a search. So we randomly generated n times n matrices with XOR count one. We know the form of these matrices, so they must be permutation matrices with one additional uh, non-zero entry. And then we checked if this matrix corresponds to a basis and an alpha such that M uh, is this M alpha beta, so the multiplication with the element alpha. So how to check this, you can uh, come up with the following theorem that says that uh, a matrix corresponds to an element multiplication if and only if the minimal polynomial of this matrix is irreducible. And to remember, the minimal polynomial is a polynomial of least degree such that if you, uh, such that when you ev evaluate um, 
evaluate the polynomial on the matrix, then it will uh, evaluate to zero. And now we can check uh, if this co uh, condition here is fulfilled. If we do this, you, uh, you can see, easily see, there exists this element with an XOR count of one for GF2 to the two, two to the three, four, five, six, seven. So the question is, does it go on forever? And unfortunately, it is not the case. So even in this very important field, um, GF2 to the eight, it is not uh, possible to find an element with the lowest X count of one. So why is it the case? We can uh, derive the following sufficient and necessary condition. Given an element alpha, then for this element there exists a basis such that we have this matrix representing multiplication with alpha with an XOR count of one, if and only if the minimal polynomial of the field element is a trinomial of degree n. By trinomial, I mean a trinomial, uh, a polynomial with weight three. So it has three non-zero coefficients. So the first dire one direction is very easy to see. We just choose this matrix as the companion matrix um, of the minimal polynomial of the field element. And then by the construction of the companion matrix, it will only consist of a permutation matrix plus an other non-zero entry. So the more interesting uh, case is that uh, having a trinomial of degree n is also a necessary condition. Then the proof idea for this is, if we consider an element alpha and a basis, a basis B for the field, and suppose, suppose we have a matrix with an XOR count of one. The first thing you can show is then that this matrix is permutation similar to this form. So we can, uh, we know the structure uh, of the permutation we apply. And since um, <coughs> the, the XOR count is invariant under permutation similarity, we then only have to show that the minimal polynomial um, of this matrix is a trinomial of degree n. And this is more easier because we already know the structure of this matrix. So and now we see why it's clear that there are, that, uh, there are no elements with XOR count one in this field because there, there does not exist irredu an irreducible trinomial of degree eight. And so there are much more other fields for this uh, is the case that there exists no irreducible trinomials. And uh, for example, by a result of Swan from 1962, there are no irreducible trinomials of degree uh, 8K for any natural number K. So for all these fields, we don't fi cannot find elements uh, with an XOR count uh, equal to one, and so on. So another thing we investigated is if there are elements with an XOR count of one, how many elements are there in, in a field for a fixed basis? And uh, you can see that there are at most two elements with an XOR count of one, and the other element is necessarily the multiplicative inverse of the first element yeah, for a fixed basis. So what about an XOR count of two? Now we characterize elements with an XOR count of one. What about higher XOR counts? And in fact, this turns out to be, um, yeah, to be very difficult to, to understand the structure here. So we did experiment, we only have experimental results here. And in particular, for, for any field dimension up to 2048, for which no irreducible trinomial of this degree exists, we found an element alpha and a basis such that the XOR count of this element is equal to two. Yeah, because of our necessary and sufficient condition for the XOR count of one, these results are proven to be optimal. So we found optimal uh, XOR counts for fields up to G2, uh, GF2 to the 48. And it is open to characterize elements with higher XOR count in general. And because the structure uh, seems to be yeah, quite difficult to, to capture. Um, what we conjecture is that uh, if, if we want to have an XOR count uh, of two, then the minimal polynomial of, of the element 
has to be of weight smaller or equal to five. Yeah, because in all our, our experiments, if we have an exo count of two, then uh, we always have a pentanomial or a trinomial in a subfield. And this is also interesting to see if we are in a subfield, uh, which means that the minimal polynomial does not have full degree, then the XOR count can never be one. And uh, if you go to higher fields, for example, GF2 to the 8, then uh, the XOR count of the subfield elements are among the, the highest XOR counts, which is quite interesting. Um, and what is also interesting is that uh, not every uh, minimal pentanomials lead to an XOR count of two. So there are pentanomials which, uh, cannot, which have a minimal XOR count of three, which indicates that this structure is, uh, is not that easy to see. So now let me come to, uh, to our next question, how to use the knowledge um, of the lightweight field elements to construct uh, lightweight MDS matrices. So let me come back to, to the example. In this example, we have a generic element alpha, and what we want to do is we want to replace this generic element by elements with the lightest XOR count in order to reduce the XOR count of this MDS matrix. So now our goal is to minimize the overhead for the multiplications. Why? Because you always have a static part for summing up the exponentiation results, and what you can, um, what you can optimize is the overhead for, for these multiplications here. And we concentrate on circulant matrices here with uh, um, powers of, a, of an element alpha. So if we denote the XOR count of some element by this weight XOR symbol, um, then if we want to compute the XOR count of alpha to the power plus minus K, you can see that this is bounded by K times the XOR count of alpha. This is because the XOR count is the same for the inverse, and then you can always implement uh, alpha K times, and you have implemented A to the power of, uh, alpha to the power of K. So we did a generic search for the MDS matrix dimension up to eight times eight. And if we denote the sum of the absolute values of, this exp of the exponents k uh, by w, then our algorithm is as follows. We searched for w1 up to a predefined value w max and constructed all circulant matrices um, with the power, uh, with alpha to, to some, some power such that the uh, absolute value of the exponent sums up to W, and then we can bound the XOR count overhead per row by this W times the weight of, of alpha. And um, <coughs> so the, uh, the algorithm returns an MDS matrix M with the smallest um, number W. w. So, and in, uh, in our cases, this leads to um, slightly lighter uh, MDS matrices known so far from, from the FSE uh, 2015 and 2016 uh, papers. So, we're able to slightly reduce uh, the extra count here if we use the knowledge of how to choose uh, different bases uh, for, uh, for the representation of the finite fields. So, and this uh, concludes my talk, and thanks for your attention.